So a lot of you need no introduction. You're CEO of Color. You were a very uh, famous individual investor and in everything from Airbnb right down to tools I use for my own startups like Retool and DBT. So given all that background, I would love to talk to you today about the state of AI, specifically how startups are working with enterprises, understand how startups should look at the future of AI technology and how they're going to think about integrating with enterprises today. And so to, to get started, I'd love to know, like, for me personally, this market is a little different than previous ones. I see a lot more startups who are specifically targeting enterprises as part of their work. Is, is that new to you? How, how do you find this market splitting out in sort of how startups are looking at their potential audience? Yeah, well, uh, first off, thanks so much for including me today. It's, it, you know, I was really looking forward to our conversation. So um, I think it'll be fun. Um, yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting because uh, I think there's been a few shifts from 10 or 20 years ago in terms of how companies get started, as well as there's been a series of human capital shifts in the AI market that we can talk about. But fundamentally, to your point, a lot of the earliest players in AI um, have really focused on the B2B side of things, or there's more and more sort of startups on the B2B side. Um, then may maybe there have been in other waves like mobile. I think a lot of the wave was like more consumer centric between things like Instagram and WhatsApp and Uber and the like. And in AI, it's a little bit more of a mix. And that mix, I think, is reflective of these waves of human capital that have come through where the very first people building on AI, uh, when it was kind of a secret, you know, and it was kind of GPT-3 was out or, you know, right around there, but we, didn't, we still didn't have GPT-4 and we didn't have, or 3.5 and 4, and we didn't have ChatGPT. A lot of those folks um, understood the model world really well. And they really focused on applications that they wanted to exist or other models, right? So Anthropic spun out of OpenAI, you had Go Here start, you had a lot of people from the Transformer Paper start companies. And then you had people like Noam Shazir start Character, which is a very early AI company. They did that as a researcher. Perplexity was a researcher focused a little bit more on like a prosumer market. Uh, and then you had folks like Harvey that immediately went to B2B as they realized these capabilities. And so the first set of founders were like AI natives. The second wave of founders so far have been uh, more infrastructure people. And that's Together and Base10 and Modal and a variety of other companies. And that, that I feel is like kind of the wave that a lot of people are paying attention to now. And then the third wave is probably people building apps across different areas in B2B and consumer. And many of those people have not shown up yet. And I think the reason is they've been exposed to AI related or generative AI, I should say, since it's very different more recently because many of them first heard about it when ChatGPT came out, which was only 14 months ago. And so if you think about it from a founder lifecycle perspective, if it takes you six to nine months to quit your job, and then three months, you're kind of messing around and recuperating, and then you spend a couple months brainstorming ideas, you're only just starting to see a lot of app founders show up. And it's just the infrastructure people heard about AI and were dealing with it earlier. And then the AI native researchers, of course, knew everything that was happening and how important these capabilities were. And so I kind of feel like we're about to hit it. And then one could argue for big enterprises still two years away because 14 months since ChatGPT is just a planning cycle, right? So the, the service now and Microsoft and Adobe and a few other players have done amazing stuff already, but most enterprises are still kind of thinking about it. Yeah, it's really interesting to me because, you know, these AI labs used to be impenetrable. You couldn't imagine getting somebody from OpenAI, somebody from DeepMind to do something outside of it. And you mentioned character AI, you know, uh, Noam's on record talking about how that existed and Google didn't want to take it to market. And so I think that there was this great era of just two years ago, you know, all of these researchers being like, hey, we're sitting on something amazing here. We want to bring it to market. And maybe that was that first generation you're talking about. Yeah, it's interesting because if you look at the original Transformer paper from 2017 that Google put out, which is the main architecture for these big models like GPT, the T stands for Transformer. Um, I think six of the eight authors have started companies. I think now it's actually seven because one just started one in Japan. Um, so seven of the eight authors have started companies. And two of them have actually started two companies already. And so it's this really fecund like outburst of the smartest researchers building some of the most interesting things. So it's very exciting. Yeah. And now I'm actually seeing it from other uh, labs and other universities as well. In fact, we're starting to see, uh, you know, the next year might be the year of generative video. And then we see labs uh, who are working on this at Stanford. We see it at UC Berkeley where people are going through and going straight from their PhD lab directly into market, which historically wasn't the case. You know, there was that, there was that like lag time between the two. 
Yeah, I think the last time I saw a lot of that happen, there was two moments. One was um, the original internet wave, right? Larry and Sergey from Google were Stanford PhD dropouts, and um, Jerry Yang was a Stanford PhD dropout. And, you know, so basically a lot of the really early internet companies in some cases had these people go straight from school. I mean, Mark Andreessen, when he started Netscape, I think was straight out of UIUC. Um, but then the second time I've seen this happen is in crypto, where you had more academically driven, particularly uh, layer one uh, protocols being built by professors or academics, right? And that was things like Zcash and Starkware and Oasis and a bunch of these other things. Um, and so it's kind of fascinating that now we're seeing in the context of AI, this, this type of wave as well. And you both see um, university professors with funds or incubators or other things, but also people starting really interesting companies. And, um, you know, Demi and her co-founder out of Pika, for example, on the video side, to your point, are um, a good example of some people straight out of a PhD program starting a company directly. And I think to your point, it's it's a very exciting trend. Yeah. And I mean, sm surprisingly small companies getting these things going, too. It's this there's almost a certain virality to this land of generative AI. I actually wonder if virality is important for adoption at this stage. Oh, it's a really interesting question. Because, um, you know, to some extent, there's two types of virality, right? There's virality that's built into a product as part of one of the central affordances of the product. Mm -hmm. That would be photo tagging in early Facebook, where it pulled other people in, but it was also a core feature. Mm. And then there's virality, which is word of mouth, right? Virality sometimes just means word of mouth. And that's, um, hey, I'm going to talk about it with my friends, or I'm going to talk about it online because it's so compelling. And I think those are two different forms, and I have different substantiations. and uses and all the rest. Yeah, I had the pleasure of working with uh, Prisma Labs, which did uh, the Lenza app. And, you know, in, in one month, they were able to basically get every single person change, <laughs> changing their uh, Facebook profile to sort of a, a cool uh, generative version. And I was, it was incredible how quickly that adopted. And I compare it to something like ChatGPT, where in, in the Valley, I think we really think of that as being the most explosive growth that's ever happened. But, you know, really, there are more people who have never touched ChatGPT by a long margin than the people who have. And so it seems like we're very, very early in this adoption cycle. And that uh, I, I wonder how much of it is kind of, uh, frothy Silicon Valley kind of version of it versus the uh, the world is ready to adopt this technology and understands fundamentally what it is. Yeah, it definitely seems like it's both, right? Simultaneously, uh, which is true of many things in early technology waves. And, um, you know, you see the time to revenue for some of these companies. And I've now seen multiple companies go from roughly zero to 10 or 20 or 30 million in revenue in a year which is insane, right? You never see that. And these are companies that are say 18 months old. And so um, you see this extremely fast adoption curve for certain things, or you look at things like Midjourney, where you know you see the adoption of products like that or ChatGPT to your point or other things. And so um, on the one hand, those things are exceptional and some of them will sustain really well. Some will get commoditized over time, but you see the pent up demand for some of these products that are generated, driven by generative AI. And then the flip side of it is anytime you have a technology shift, you end up with, you know, 99% of companies not really being worth much at the end of the day or being, you know, red herrings or whatever you want to call it. You know, as a founder, it's always challenging to ask, am I part of the 1% or 99% in terms of the things that will work or not work? Mm -hmm. And even if it works early, is it going to work long term? And how do I feel defensive, build defensibility and moats behind what I'm doing and all the rest of it? And so I do think we're in this really interesting moment in time where um, we're seeing this exuberant behavior because there's a, this really important shift that happens once every 10, 20 years, uh, maybe more or for something like this, um, maybe more. Um, and I would argue actually that overall AI is underhyped because the enterprise stuff hasn't even happened. And so think of the impact of multiple large enterprises adopting this and the impact to their end users and impact to uh, cloud providers like Azure or other infrastructure companies, you know, in terms of just adoption and rate of growth. And it's just, I think everybody's kind of actually underestimating it. Um, yeah, you know, every CIO that's out there right now has the board saying, okay, I, in six months, I have to say what my AI strategy is. It's like the most common thing that I get by and large. And I get a number of excellent startups who find themselves sort of chasing what are the right answers for 
you know, the people who are coming with like, and answer my existential crisis, you know, how am I going to deal with hallucinations? What, like, you know, how do I describe this value to where it is? Um, are, do you think we're just simply too early? Um, I don't think so. I think we have a lot of capabilities today that can deal with a lot of near-term issues. Um, that's separate from saying, what can we do with future capabilities, right? And so there's ways to deal with hallucinations, like technologies called RAG or other things that can be done to deal with them. Um, and so I feel like some of those things are a little bit overstated. Um, obviously, we're still building out a lot of tooling and things like that. But the way I think of it is almost like a GPT ladder, right? Like, if you look at um, Harvey, the legal AI company, um, you know, they were really enabled in part by GPT-4 level models, right? You needed a more advanced reasoning model and um, knowledge base and everything else to be able to tackle legal. And you probably couldn't do what they do on GPT-3. But the question is what markets open up or what capabilities open up when you get GPT-5 equivalency or GPT-6 or GPT-7. And so I think with each increment up, an entire set of markets and use cases are going to open up for either founders or incumbents to go after. And right now, at least, that's an 18 to 24 month cycle. Um, it's possible at some point that we move more towards sort of continuous training or continuous effectively fine tuning of a model over time or, or you know, RLHF or something else of a model. And so um, uh, if you move to that world and suddenly the model, instead of increasing in big steps, you kind of have this continuous increase in capabilities, right? And so that may be the future world in a couple generations of these things. But in the short run, I feel every time there's a big model release, things will change, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and so you mentioned Harvey AI, and that's a great example, because that's, uh, you know, in my startup coaching, one of the first things we would say is, hey, uh, legal, that's a terrible tech market. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to sell into legal. You know, similarly, like a lot of times in education, it can be really, really difficult. You're looking at a sales cycle that's more than a year. Maybe you missed the window. And then how do you handle the rest of your next year? Should startups be thinking of these other markets as enterprise? Should they be thinking how they would enter it differently? Yeah, I think that um, there's the B2B side and there's a the consumer side, and those are very different. I think on the B2B side, um, a lot of what uh, I've been thinking about is if you look at the US software market, I believe it's about half a trillion a year in spend. If you look at the set of services that you think are disruptable by generative AI, or at least adaptable to generative AI, and you just look at their payroll, it's something like 3.5 trillion in headcount. And so if you can capture 10% of that value as a human in the loop tool or whatever, and make those teams dramatically more efficient, you've almost recreated the entire software market, all software. That's right. incredible. Yeah, I never thought about yeah. it. Before. Yeah, so you have like this enormous um, uh, area at stake. And then the question is, is there already an incumbent tool or workflow there? Because if so, the incumbent will just add it and win, right? Um, and or, or is it Greenfield? Or is it all being done in docs and spreadsheets and email and all the rest? And so then it it's, it's addressable via a workflow tool of some sort. Um, and then you add AI to it. Uh, and is it highly repetitive, high value work? Like you can start creating the criteria by which you start assessing which markets are tractable or not tractable for these things. And there's a lot of them that actually appear to be tractable. And then you start asking, okay, does that go to incumbents or does that go to startups in terms of value? Well, um, right now we're seeing a lot of incumbents, frankly. You know, and one of the big questions that I get, you know, for these startups is, hey, they're already selling to these enterprises. Incumbents are right there with them. How can a startup be part of that process? How could they actually get in the sales cycle if there are already incumbents coming with tools already? Yeah, I think it depends a lot on the market. So in legal, um, I don't think there are very many workflow incumbents. There's data incumbents like Thomson Reuters and folks like that. But from a workflow capture perspective, there isn't a ton. Um, and there's probably like three or four different areas of legal alone that I think startups could exist in. Um, and you know, I'm actively looking for more things that don't overlap with Harvey. Um, there are other areas around uh, multiple other markets that are kind of obvious uh, related to that as well. To your point, I think, if, you know, if you if, if you look at every single technology wave, there's a differential split between startups and incumbents. So you look at the internet, right? And that was probably 80% startups, right? Most of the value went to Amazon and Google and people like that. And then you look at uh, the mobile wave and probably 80 to 90% of the value went to incumbents, right? The big platforms ended up being Apple and Google who at that point were incumbents. CRM on your phone was Salesforce on your phone, right? Um, search on your phone was Google on your phone, et cetera. Uh, Docs on your phone was, you know, um, 
uh, Microsoft, right? And so the the incumbents kind of adapted really well. And then if you look at the startups that emerged, there were companies that uniquely took advantage of the new capabilities of the devices and therefore created new market opportunities or, or moved them onto mobile. So that was Uber. You press a button and a stranger shows up in a car and you get in and you're fine with it and they drive you somewhere, <laughs> right? It's Instacart, it's you know um, Instagram, you know new social behaviors because everybody suddenly has a camera phone, which they didn't 10 years before. Yeah. So you literally couldn't do it, right? Um, so the, the companies that beat the incumbents or created new incumbents due to the mobile wave were ones where you uniquely use those characteristics. Yeah. If you look at crypto, it was 100% startups. And so each wave is different, right, in terms of where value goes. And value means people, the smartest people, and market cap, and revenue, and earnings, and, you know, however you want to define it. And so the big question for generative AI is, like, what is that differential split between incumbent and startup value? And it's one of those areas which feels big enough that even if the majority of it goes to Incumbents are still a lot that can go to startups back to the services point or other sorts of industries that may be at this point antiquated and um, available or open to the specific types of capabilities that generative AI brings, but it needs to map to capabilities just like it did in mobile. Yeah, you know, another major area I was part of was cloud. And obviously I'm sitting here from the, the cloud side of it. And actually we saw a number of major startups make a huge difference in cloud. But we saw a combination too, right? Infrastructure tended to go more towards incumbents, but then you had Databricks, for example, who's able to go in and take something that literally every enterprise has. Uh, we saw a, a number of uh, examples where we have startups going through and you know, repurposing SAP systems, all these other places mm -hmm. where there's just ripe for disruption because all of a sudden, you know, Networks are invisible. A lot of these costs go to nothing. Other ways to think of the problems. Uh, in this generative AI space, where are sort of those areas that enterprises aren't looking? What are the, every enterprise has, but nobody has actually really spent time looking into it yet? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I've been spending um, quite a bit of time on that. And on a market by market basis, I think there's different opportunities. And the way I think about the opportunities is they fall into three classes or categories, um, or I guess four types. Uh, one is, is there incumbent or not? It's mm -hmm. really owning that area and just adds AI and you're done. Yeah. If there's not, right, then you go into the next step. Um, because in general, it's kind of a bad idea to just go and compete with somebody unless you really have some form of differentiation. And, um, you know, sometimes you can find it. I mean, that's the whole innovator's dilemma and all creative destruction and all the rest of it. But often the incumbent can just add something three years late and still win, right? Mm. Because of distribution. Um, but once you get over that hump and you say, okay, it's a little bit more greenfield or there's opportunities for startups, there's a question of does a startup exist or not? If not, do you wait or do you incubate? And then um, there's also some situations where a startup exists, but nobody adopts their software, not because it isn't great for the customers, but because there's some regulatory issue or there's some bureaucracy inside the customers that prevents adoption of certain things or misincentives. And then you may want to consider a buyout. And so I've actually been looking at like AI driven buyouts and what does that mean? And, you know, other assets that make sense to effectively purchase and then tear out the guts of and add AI and make them dramatically more efficient or create new functionality or whatever it is. And so I actually view it through those three lenses, you know, uh, uh, a, is there incumbent or not, but then the three lenses of like invest, incubate, or buyout. Yeah, I definitely want to ask more about buyout, but I don't want to lose one question in there. And it's probably one of my top questions for AI startups, which is they're thinking about governance, regulation, trying to understand how they would work in this space. You know, a lot of pressure from the AI Act in Europe. I have startups who say they're in the United States, even though they're based in Europe, because they're worried about a potential regulation. How much does that really matter? Uh, regulation matters enormously. You know, the good forms of regulation is, hey, the FDA makes sure we don't have tainted baby formula in the US. And that's, you know, obviously there's been outbreaks of that in China, well, you know, societally. Um, and the bad form of regulation is, um, you know, why do we spend more money developing drugs, but we roughly have the same number of drugs approved per year as we did 20 years ago, despite that increase in spend? Or um, why does it take 14 years to develop a drug or whatever it is now on average? And if you look at our um, what happened in COVID, 
is we removed a bunch of regulation. We said, let's move as fast as possible. And let's be a little bit more willing to test certain things on people uh, faster. And we ended up with multiple vaccines in nine months. Yeah. We ended up with multiple treat- treatments like um, Plexlovid and others in a year or so. And so we had extremely fast pace of innovation there when we removed regulation. And we had very few adverse events or big side effects or issues related to that. And so the question is, why don't we do more of that? Um, there's a very good um, video you can find uh, where they interviewed Janssen, who started Janssen Pharmaceuticals, which is a huge acquisition by J&J. Yep. And he spoke about this and he, he talks about regulation and healthcare. And it's really worth watching because you see the degree to which he, he believes that certain types of regulation completely stymie or destroy innovation. And while there's good aspects to regulation, you also have to balance that against like, what is the harm that it causes and how do you find the right middle ground? Yeah, I'm often helping startups reframe that question. Uh, You know, you mentioned drug trials. If we actually go back two years, there were no generative drugs in trial. And then there were seven drugs the next year that made it to clinical trials. And now like there's literally an exponential curve that you can go look, go to PubMed, search for like Mm. deep learning and AI and mention in articles and you will see an exponential curve there. It's, Mm -hmm. it's unbelievable what those opportunities actually exist. So you could almost say that, you know, regulation and governance are simply an opportunity to create a business. Like, <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I think sometimes um, regulation opens up markets for people like some Sara's early products were accelerated into regulation. But mm-hmm. I think most of the time it makes things much, much worse. And so if I had to choose between the two, I'd rather have less regulation of certain things and more. A friend of mine has a framework or theory that the reason technologists are so optimistic is because traditionally they haven't been regulated that much. So they can be optimistic about the future. <laughs> and I think that's a very, uh, you know, pithy uh, view of it. Yeah, absolutely understood. Um, and I mean, it's it's one of the pieces of strategic value that we try to offer at Microsoft is like helping startups think through this, think about responsible frameworks, think about how those things are going to come through. Um, really try to help that enterprise adoption curve where people have a hard time evaluating this on their own. Are there tricks for startups to help them like understand if a market is going to make sense for them to go in? If they're, you know, coming from, you know, it's sort of that innovator's dilemma, they see an opportunity, but maybe they can't identify the market on their own. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And um, to your point, a lot of it just comes down to like, can you see a market need? Mm -hmm. Um, Or is there like a clear why now statement? So a change in regulation is a why now for a market where suddenly, you know, there's a new need to have in-cab video. Um, person regulations are rolled out in the U.S. and so it accelerates some SARA adoption, right? And so there's a why now statement on the both the regulatory side but also the technology side. Suddenly the market is available because you have um, sufficient bandwidth in fleets and um, you have uh, earlier forms of AI where you could do like video recognition of things and so you could actually see if the driver is falling asleep and alert them and help wake them up or things like that, right? As they're driving on the road for these long stints. And so you had a mix of technology and regulation actually create a new industry and really valuable technology and usefulness for the world in terms of safety and things like that. So by the way, I'm not anti all regulation. It's more just like finding the balance. Um, I think one of the things that people talk about a lot is all the NLP and LLMs and sort of the, the, the models that understand language. But to your point, there's all these foundation models now that people are building for robotics, for healthcare, for chemistry, material science, physics. And I know Microsoft, for example, has done some cool things there, but that feels to me like one of those areas where there's probably a lot to do and there still aren't that many people doing it. Similar, honestly, to the app side. I still think there's very few people building apps, but the flip side of it is there aren't that many people building really interesting foundation models for other application areas. And that can be incredibly enabling societally. So I think there's some really exciting stuff um, to do there as well. And to your point, the question is, okay, what's the user need? Let's not just build a model for model's sake, but how does that integrate into drug development or material science discovery or um, virtu- uh, uh, simulation environments for building and construction? You you allude to something that I think is really important. And I get asked this question all the time because I have worked with companies who are doing chemistry and physics and material science and all these other things. But it's very difficult for them at this moment because... The, the cost of infrastructure to go and build this and plus the time to go through and understand it, it's not really necessarily, it's almost its own domain. It's building on something completely different. And it's a major hurdle to even get access to the infrastructure to go and do that. And so we end up seeing 
the market force is almost pulling along with the lines of, well, I can deliver this value sooner to market. And so people who get the further afield have sort of an uphill battle to climb. I'm kind of curious where you're seeing these challenges for AI adoption. Is it really just needing to be closer to the activity that's happening or can these things work in parallel paths? Yeah, it's a really good question because software is easy in some sense, right? And it's fast to test, it's fast to build, it's easy to distribute, it's costless to scale up to a point in some ways, right? Like the marginal cost of producing an incremental mm -hmm. server yeah, instance is a great book. <laughs> Decades yeah, <ago. laughs> so, yeah, so, you know, software has enormous advantages. And the second you start dealing with the real world, you realize how incredibly tough mm -hmm. it is to build, a, to deal with atoms and infrastructure and all the things that you mentioned. Um, and that's back to like, then how can you find user value fast enough that you, you're doing something useful that you can start funding in part off of revenue, or at least show enough progress that other people will give you money to keep going, right? And so a lot of the exercise uh, in these sort of uh, science-driven domains or atom-driven domains uh, are very different types of companies and very different types of beasts. The flip side of it is that you can have some pretty dramatic impact if you're working in the right area. So it's a bit of a trade-off. I think from a framework perspective, all else being equal, if I was a founder today, I'd probably focus on the easy software stuff yeah. because early in a market, the most accessible uh, things, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit when a market is early and AI is very early or generative AI is a very early market. So there's all these things that are just lying around that you can do. Late in a market, that's when you want to do the hard stuff because all the easy stuff has been done. And so generic advice for market cycles is do the easy stuff early. Don't assume it's already being done because there's tons of stuff nobody's doing that are just easy opportunities that you should go after. And then 10 years from now, go do the material science stuff, you know, if you want to, because it's a, it's a much harder problem. And of course, people do both, right? It's obviously we want people working on both over time. But I do think as a founder, you're going to have an easier path doing the easier thing because it's available. It, and it leads me to ask the question, which is perhaps the biggest challenge in the software piece is the skills gap. You know, there a, a lot of startups go and they ask me, the first question is, hey, Rob, who do you know? Who can I hire? Um, by the way, I, how do I build my own team? Do I, you know, do I teach them how to do this? I go out and try to do training. Do I have to go and hire somebody who's coming batteries loaded? It's the great era of specialists. How does a startup founder think through that skills gap, given that nobody actually has two years of experience working with LLMs. Yeah, I think people learn stuff pretty fast. I remember when mobile came out, I had a big debate with the guy who was the mobile lead at Twitter, who uh, honestly didn't know much about mobile. And um, his claim was that you needed these specialists to uh, do mobile and we need to find these specialized resources and we're gonna spend months looking. And I was just like, just hire some really good engineers and I'll pick it up over a couple months, right? Cause it was right when the iPhone SDK first came out. It was really early days, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like there was this depth of knowledge going back two decades that you sent, you, you know, it wasn't like learning all of uh, biology and getting a PhD in bio and then doing cutting as research. It was just like different types of code and different UI and, but you could figure it out, you know? Um, then there's other places where you absolutely need expertise. Like if you're building a data center, you shouldn't have a smart software engineer come in and wing it, which I saw one company do and they, they, they had real issues from that. So I, I just think, um, you need to be thoughtful about where expertise is needed and where it isn't. The other piece of um, founder advice that I hear a lot, which I think is terrible advice, is that you should do every role before you hire somebody to run that function for you. Mm. So you should do sales before you hire a salesperson. You should do customer support before you hire a customer support person, et cetera. The extreme version of that is, you know, I started this company called Color, which was a early sort of genomics and healthcare delivery company. And we had genetic counselors on staff. And we had pathologists, we had all sorts of different expertise on staff, which of course, I'm never going to go do that role. Right. And it just shows you how ridiculous that concept is, right? Like, there are other ways that you can find talented people with sufficient domain expertise. And when people talk about the athlete versus the expert, I'm like, why don't you hire an expert who's also an athlete, you know, who's just smart and picks things up quickly and is nimble, and they can focus on their expertise, but obviously you want a high caliber person. Unfortunately, you, you just can never figure this out with one single trick, right? You have to actually go through and really understand your business. I think it, it leads to the question of, you know, you can go out and buy some of this technology directly. And I think sometimes, you know, model selection is probably the top question that I get asked. 
You know, a lot of startups say, hey, am I going to go and build this model? Is that going to make my moat? Or could I go and just pay for GPT-4? When it comes to those like selections, how, how do you start thinking about this from a founder perspective? How do they make those choices of build versus buy? Yeah, you know, what I've seen at a lot of uh, both uh, startups as well as bigger enterprises is um, sometimes they jump straight to like, I'm going to fine tune my own model. And that turns out to be a huge mistake because yeah. you're taking on all this operational overhead and other things for no real reason. And eventually people converge back to, I'm just going to try it on GPT-4. It's the most advanced model. And if it doesn't work there, it's just not going to work right now. And obviously you can do some small bespoke models that are fine-tuned or trained, uh, post-trained in certain ways for you or the like. But um, the reality is for many things, if it doesn't work on GPT-4, it's not going to work. Now, if it works on GPT-4, you start making trade-offs in terms of cost and performance and latency and other things. And then in some cases you say, okay, I'm going to go and use a, a open source model or I'll use 3.5 if it's closed source, I'll use Anthropic or whatever it is. And so often you see people prototype and then say, okay, for some workloads we can afford the various aspects of GPT-4, not just from pricing, but also time to first token and other aspects. And then for other use cases or other aspects of what we're doing, we're going to use GPT-3.5 or we're going to fine tune Mistral or Llama or other things, and so which are open source models. And so, you know, and then they have something that will route um, traffic or prompts or queries or whatever it is between the different models, the built some sort of orchestrator. Yeah, Lang Chain, ma major orchestrator for a lo lot of people. We see a lot of mm -hmm. different people playing with different open source methods of stitching these models together. Even weird ideas like, how do you score multiple models working at the same time? I do wonder if you run into a production nightmare there. Because yeah, a lot yeah. of people doing agents, for example, very well. Yeah, I think agents has other... Um... Uh, challenges technically in terms of reasoning and how good is your reasoning. And then you have some form of memory that you can refer back to. And so I think the true agentic world is still awaiting some technology, which we're, you know, act, people are actively building. And then to your point on the eval side, I think there's companies like Brain Trust, which are basically offering like a suite there, right? They have like eval and prompt playground and data management and logging and proxies and all this. And so, you know, there's some companies now providing these end to end suites. Um, like what BrainTrust is doing, which allows you to sort of eval multiple models against each other and compare and then proxy out in terms of the, the traffic. Um, but there's a lot of infrastructure still to build, right? It's very early days to your point. We're maybe two years into the revolution, but really a year into people being very interested. Um, and so it's it's still early days, but it's, I think, the, the exciting time in a tech cycle. And we are seeing this interesting adoption. I'm now becoming familiar with like these efficient language models. And all the developers are just like, all I care is that it fits on my laptop so that I can mess with it. Mm -hmm. Is is this really sort of more about great, like I, I would almost call it like dev accessibility or ergonomics of working with the model? Is that the important thing that people should be focused on? You know, it's really interesting because one of the things that's under discussed relative to the emergence of generative AI is that you can access it via APIs in many cases, mm -hmm. unless you're doing something very bespoke in terms of fine tuning or RAG or other things. And even the open source models you now can access via APIs, um, either in terms of things like I believe Llama is running on Azure, but also there's companies like Together or Perplexity or others who are just doing inference APIs, right? Where you could access Mistral 7B or other models. And so you know, one of the really interesting shifts is when you used to use AI in the old world of CNNs and RNNs and GANs and all the rest, you had to set up all these models, you had to run ML ops, you had all this complex tooling. Now you can just ping an API. It's amazing, right? And so suddenly anybody at any company anywhere in the world can have access to these capabilities that used to be only available to a, hand, a handful of people, right? The chosen of AI or whatever. And so I think that's very under discussed. This wave isn't important just because of the, the capability step up of the transformer and diffusion models, but also because of the, um, the API accessibility of them. You suddenly can just ping an API. It's dramatically different. Yeah, you know, a lot of startups that I'm working with, I help them, you know, fine tune via an API even. All these things are available on Azure where people are actually going through and doing models as a service, models as a platform, thinking about an API versus not. But there's still this big question for people, which is, does open source matter? And I wonder if it's even a different question, which is, is does open weights matter? Because a lot of times you're not getting that through an API. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, open source matters. Um, you know, I, I think fundamentally there are some things that you want to run yourself, but also 
fine tune or manipulate or change yourself in different ways that, you know, there are increasingly APIs available for some of the closed source models to do fine tuning or other things. Like I believe OpenAI has an API for that, you know, so I think it's possible with, with closed models, but it's really nice to be able to get your hands on something and really do what you want with it. Now that's a very advanced use case. Mm -hmm. And the big question in my mind is, um, there's basically two types of models. There's the frontier models, the most cutting edge, most capable models, yep. which today is GPT-4. But I think this year there's going to be at least five companies that come out with GPT-4 level products. And uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any inside information on this, but I'm assuming like GPT, excuse me, OpenAI comes out with some version of like 4.5 or 5, right? Yep. Um, and so we'll see a step up in capabilities at the frontier. And then there's the stuff below the frontier. Right, which um, is the stuff that's like you care more about performance and inference cost and time to first token and latency and all these things more than necessarily the exact specific model you're using because you're losing the, the advantage of advanced capabilities. Right, it's stuff lower in the curve. It's sort of like in the 90s, you'd pay up for the best microprocessor that could be in your computer. And every generation was a big step up from the 386 to the 486 to whatever. Uh -huh. um, but the chips that were older, the 286 chip was super cheap, yeah, right, and super available. And there was AMD versions, and all you know, is a more of a commodity market. And you could assume the same thing will happen in the model world, where the frontier will be the place for competition based on performance uh, in terms of capabilities, and um, lower uh, in terms of uh, model capabilities are not on the frontier. You'll be competing more on inference time and. Uh, cost and and some customizability and other things that you'll probably need. Is this iPhone versus Android, or is this how you want to think about your ad adoption cycle? Because when I'm talking to a startup, mm -hmm. I often say GPT-4, GPT-3.5 will get you enough grounding that you can go through and answer these questions. And let's worry about the costs only as much as we have to worry about getting to market. Yeah, I think that's very true. Like uh, you don't want to. Um, it's back to like you prototype on GPT-4, say. Yeah. And because the most advanced capabilities, if you can't make it work there, it doesn't matter. And you don't worry about cost or latency or other things at small scale. And then the question is, once it's in production and you're dealing with millions of users, like how do you think about it? And four may still be the right option. Um, but it's possible there may be other things that you want to do. Yeah, in our own framework of talking about this, we have model adaptation, model deployment, and then this like performance life cycle of going through and handling it. And... Mm -hmm. There's so much you could do in the performance life cycle, but in practice, um, we're, we're finding actually don't tell people to, to fine tune unless cost is, they know is going to be a problem in advance. And then, you know, we'll start with a GPT-3.5 model with an API um, or even just go all the way to the other extreme and focus on a really small model and see if we can build something custom to their use case. And so it almost seems as though you can ask the, the really simple question, uh, how much is this going to relate to like a staff? You know, <laughs> is the, the cost yeah. experiment like equivalent to the cost? Of like, what am I like having another colleague? You know, how do I, how do I make that choice? Yeah, um, that's so interesting. How does, um, and you may or may not be able to share this, so if not, no worries, but um, how does workloads on Azure break out between these small bespoke sort of hyper-trained models versus you know, slightly larger ones versus the frontier. I'm just sort of curious, like, where is most of the activity today? Yeah, you know, uh, there's so many use cases for older models that run on Azure. Um, you, you, you talk about kind of the, the laggards in the space. You have lots of people running really old embedding models, really old, like GPT-2. Um, and it's probably really essential for what they're doing. I think in the Valley, we get very focused on just the frontier side of what we're talking mm. about. But if I go look in practice, obviously the GPT models are incredibly important. But in fact, you have people who are running AI loads in production right now, and they don't have a clear path to upgrade necessarily. It's going to have other effects on what they're doing. And so we see a, a surprisingly large number of old models. And we also see a surprisingly large number of uh, people who will go and spin up something just to try it you know, the just experimentation side of things. So it's it's a pretty diverse world when you start thinking at cloud scale. You have a lot of customers all through every adoption cycle. Yeah. So how important do you think the frontier is? Um, I would say 
uh, if you are a startup, the frontier is where you should be. <laughs> mm. um, the you want to be differentiated from the 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 people who are working on the enterprise cycle. Uh, that's interesting. Do you think it matters for the enterprise then as much? I think for the enterprise, you need to be able to answer their questions, and their questions are mm. things like, "So I have data, and I want to select this thing, but I don't trust you to look at my data." Mm. You know, <laughs> so yeah. could you could you work with this synthetic? Could you work with something else? They're less concerned about maybe a little bit less sensitive to cost, maybe a little bit more sensitive to how would I work with the startup? Mm -hmm. um, and I would say synthetics are interesting, but I don't necessarily uh, believe enterprises think that that's going to work for them. And you could end up in a bunch of enterprise theater at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, if if somebody really loves what you're making, hey, that's probably matters the most in my my personal opinion. But uh, regulated markets are always going to be different. So when you see fintechs, will have startups who actually have to prove exactly what data sources they used to go in and work on the fintech. And so you start mm -hmm. seeing different sets of technologies in play. So for example forests instead of transformers <laughs> how can i prove every step of what i do all the way down and then really interesting uses of other sorts of technologies including things like graphs so it's a pretty pretty wide marketplace and there's not necessarily universal adoption at this point in the, in the market yeah it's kind of interesting to ask if there are any new tools that are needed for compliance and security for llms or other models that uh don't currently exist or that people are just building out right now relative to what you just mentioned in terms of everything from you know data governance uh on through to other aspects of that so it's kind of an interesting broader potential opportunity maybe for startups or incumbents the big question that's on my mind right now is you know i don't think that there's an enterprise who cares about which uh, vector database they're using Mm -hmm. They would much prefer an integrated approach to handling this because they don't want to deal with the trade-offs of things like tokens and context window size and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. And so whereas that is absurdly important, if you're a startup who's trying to optimize this perfectly for a bunch of enterprises, if you are in that dev tool chain, you need to be as verticalized as possible, but still answer the big questions around compliance and governance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's maybe the big difference between how startup uh, or, or hackers think about the world and people working at enterprises is often, you know, uh, you want to get your hands on the coolest, neatest, most cutting edge fun stuff. But that doesn't mean it's actually important in the enterprise context, right? In that enterprise context, you may want to abstract away some of that stuff. And so um, you see that very strongly in founders or companies trying to address a developer market, but then try and sell into enterprise. And sometimes that works through a PLG motion or something, but sometimes you run into that roadmap of like, actually anybody above a certain size just doesn't effectively care that much, you know? So I think that's very under discussed relative to all that stuff. I'd love to understand from your mind, uh, should a startup who's working for an enterprise uh, and trying to adopt today, what is like the, the, uh, the two biggest pieces of advice is that you would give to a, a startup who's trying to go and, uh, attack the enterprise market for the first time? Yeah, I think um, there'd maybe be three pieces of advice. Uh, one is figure out if you can upfront what a really core user need is versus, hey, here's some cool technology or whatever. So try and really understand a specific customer, what they need to do, how they need to do it. Um, two is I would iterate and ship fast. Mm -hmm. So if your default instinct is to build a model, in most cases, that's the wrong instinct. In some cases, it's the right one. But often it's just like prototype it really fast on GPT-4 or some frontier model test it out against those customers, and then you can potentially do something more bespoke, but try to focus on iteration speed and time to understanding over doing something interesting or cool on the technical side. And then lastly, I would just figure out, you know, long-term, how do you think about distribution and go to market and all the other pieces of it that end up becoming really important? Who's your real customer? And what's that real customer envelope that you're shooting against? And there's lots of people that you could talk to, but maybe you shouldn't go talk to big enterprises yet. Maybe you should start with mid-sized companies where they're going to move faster. They're going to give you good feedback, but they may also not take you down the wrong path from a development perspective. And that's a that's a common mistake is people actually talk to really big companies too soon sometimes. Let, let's wrap up for today. I've really enjoyed our conversation and I can't thank you enough. Uh, it's been a real treat for me.